that's not <coughs> so far, so I'm going to do my best to ensure that I'm honest in what I have to say and that my methods are transparent, but I will leave you to judge that. I know you won't be a word of it if I don't follow those two remits. Um, this, in a sense, is, I suppose, in, to some sense, the kind of um, opposite side of certainly what Paul was talking about this morning. And the message that came from Paul this morning was, look, hey guys, if you really want to understand whether or not people think uh, whether they trust governments or not, is essentially it's to do with substantive outcome. Um, and in a sense, then, Sarah is telling us, well, yes, it's substantive output because the substantive output is at odds with the discourse and people, politicians dissemble, all right? Now, I, this talk, in a sense, is going back to look at the other thing, aspect, which is often talked about in the area of uh, political trust, and is often presented, not least by politicians, as the answer to improving political trust, and i.e. that is to look at process. So I'm going to look at political process rather than expectations or, or output, and hopefully in between as well, we've come up with a picture. Um, I just want to remind you a little bit of um, what was being said by Labour politicians before 1997. Um, uh, uh, Peter Manson and uh, Roger Little in their famous book on the New Labour before 1997 said that, you know, the Labour government would come up with a new constitutional settlement and a new relationship of trust between politicians and the people. And on that glorious morning at five o'clock um, in uh, May 1997, after polling day, uh, Tony Blair said in his, his speech um, on the South Bank that um, he's going to have a government that seeks to restore politics in this country, that decentralizes it, that gives people hope again that politics is and should be and always is about the service of the public. <coughs> And the Labour Party undoubtedly came to office in 1997 with a non-trivial programme of constitutional reform. However, it was a programme of constitutional reform that was rather uneven in its characteristics. So um, there was lots of change introduced in Scotland, and in Wales, and eventually in Northern Ireland. But so far as the game of Westminster was concerned, it largely emerged unscathed. There was a limited degree of Lord's reform. The, a lot of the hereditary peers were thrown out, and that's as far as it got. And of course, so far as the uh, question of changing the electoral system for the House of Commons, absolutely nothing happened. What there was under Labour was very much an attempt to try and deal with what were felt to be some of the uh, problems that were revealed by the difficulties of the back to basics uh, regime of General Major was much more scrutiny, accountability, transparency, and regulation um, through things like the political parties and election's representation. Let's force the politicians to tell us how they're being funded. That will solve the problem of people being worried about the way in which politics is funded. Um, we'll have a Freedom of Information Act, and therefore people won't worry about whether or not you know, politicians are being honest or not. Well, what we learned, of course, during the, those 13 years is that what the Freedom of Information Act exposes is not necessarily pretty. And of course, the MP's expense scandal was the unintended consequences of the passage of the Information Act, as it eventually caught up with the uh, House of Commons. And also, of course, if you start introducing regulation, you then create potential pitfalls that people trip over, even though when actually probably they're being, uh, being used more. So Wendy Alexander, the Scottish Labour leader, you know, uh, mistakenly took a, um, uh, a donation to a leadership campaign um, from somebody who wasn't on the way to the register and of course the Mike and she resigns. Well, you know, the regulation caused the problem rather than arguably her behaviour. And equally Peter Hay couldn't quite get his accounts right in his deputy <coughs> and he also suffered. So the problem with accountability regulation is that you then, by making the process tighter, you make it easier to fall foul of the rules, and thereby, as a result, arguably you help to undermine trust rather than to reinforce it. Well, um, the coalition <coughs> came in with, if you go back to the, uh, the original program for government, <coughs> with a well, a different approach to constitutional reform, and arguably, arguably, this was potentially a more reforming government, so far as constitutional reform is concerned, than the previous Labour administration. Um, and that, and that um, in, for a start, you know, it all was committed to things that were intended to change Westminster. Fixed-term parliaments, 
changing the electoral system for, that, for the House of Commons, or at least we have a referendum on it, um, and also reforming the House of Lords. Um, equally, it was then also concerned to come up with what we call more... So those are kind of rather traditional. It does take the existing Westminster model of party government and reforming it. But secondly, also, there was, again, partly the time of Labour, but a revival of interest in what we might call a candidate-centred um, insti institutions and rules. So uh, a renewed interest in directly elected mayors, the uh, creation of police commissions, having open primaries so that parties no longer simply control uh, the section process. <coughs> but then also, and perhaps, perhaps rather surprisingly, given this was a conservative-dominated government, it was also a government that its program government was committed to some pretty uh, radical, at least by traditional uh, British standards, forms of direct democracy. You know, lots of promises for referendums, you know, for Wales, uh, uh, for directly for directed mayors, for whether or not the council tax is going to go up too much or not. The idea that the public would actually be able to initiate local referendums on an issue of concern wouldn't be binding, but the local council would have, would, would have to listen. And also the idea of MPs recall, obviously something particularly came out of the MPs expenses scandal. So there was arguably here a much more radical program uh, being offered. Now, of course, the reality has turned out to be a little different. Um, so in part, the question I'm going to ask is, does it matter that the coalition has largely failed to implement a large chunk of its process reforms for our hopes of trying to improve trust? And he pulls out some of the, no, it doesn't matter, and we'll see whether or not we agree with it when we get to the end of the presentation. So some things have been implemented. We've got fixed-term parliaments. Uh, we've got police and crime commissioners, which, of course, uh, uh, was a real success when it came to encouraging political participation. <laughs> uh, and we've had a whole variety of uh, referendums on Wales. Now, one or two, of course, that weren't in intended, uh, i.e. we've got one in Scotland next year, and uh, we've got one that, and although the, the referendums that have promised on Europe have been legislated for, but of course, there are referendums no meant to take place because you know meant to give more powers to Brussels, but of course, there's not a promise for one anyway, it's always good anyway. But on the contrast, things have been abundant. Well, the alternative vote, the election said no thanks. Uh, Lords reform, Tory back benches said no. Dar elected mayors in most of the cities, the vote voters said no thanks. The local initiatives got thrown up during the House of Lords. The open primaries have died. And MPs recall have pretty much died, but it's kind of been air has been pumped back into it. Uh, but it's now being heavily criticised as not really being an adequate reform at all. So there's an awful lot that happened, but yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, now, what we were interested in, because we conceived of this project um, basically in 2010, shortly after the coalition was the coalition, so well, hang on, we went to this project to see whether or not this program might actually have some impact, right? So I think that's where we come from. So the question we're now really asking is, well, you know, could, it have, could it have been helpful if it had been implemented? Um, and in doing that, we were partly drawn by the fact that, for example, particularly when it came to, to um, questions of direct democracy, that certainly some of the comparative literature uh, uh, suggests that, you know, uh, first of all, that mechanisms of direct democracy, things like referendums and initiatives, are, seem to appeal more to people who have low levels of trust, so maybe this is, you know, this is the, this is the answer. And that secondly, uh, in the comparative literature in the United States is that in places like California, where the initiative is available, trust seems to be rather higher than it is in those states where it's not. So there's a kind of little bit of kind of, you know, Slide evidence out there to suggest that our, uh, our project had at least a few legs to walk on. Um, how was this done? Well, we put in modular questions on the 2011 British Social Attitudes Survey um, uh, and a whole variety of questions on coalitions reforms and lots of other things as well, many of which I'm not going to show you. Okay, um, now one of the things I suspect we might want to discuss during the course of the day is. That boring survey methodological question, but some of us, I'm afraid, are interested in boring issues of survey methodology, um, which is, well, how do we measure trust in government anyway? What do we mean? How do we uncover trust as, as compared with all the other possible things with which it might be contaminated? So I think on the grounds of transparency, I should read you the wording of the question that we're using here. And this is a question that's on British Social Happens for quite a while. It tries, it tries to get people to leave aside their partners that shit, though whether it succeeds is another matter. And it reads, how much do you trust British governments of any party to place the interests of the nation above the interests of their own political party? So that's very, trust is kind of defined in a very particular way. Maybe arguably getting a little bit to some of the things that Sarah was talking about. 
Uh, what I'm showing you here are, is the percentage of people over the years who have said that they never trust governments. The scale goes from always trust to never trust. These are the people who say, I really don't trust these, these guys. And as you can see, <coughs> the spikes up and down. Elections are always good for, for, for restoring trust. Um, and actually, Gordon Brown becoming Prime Minister was quite good for trust as well, believe it or not, shortly afterwards. Uh, but over, over the long run, you can see that that trust has uh, not been, uh, has got, got down, and that particularly New Labour utterly failed in that project to try and improve trust in politics. Things kept on getting worse rather than getting better, at minimum, please note. these um, notes. We've got a second measure, which is a new, a new question that we uh, created for this project, um, where we were thought, well, you're relying on single measures is not very good survey practice, etc. So here we simply said, well, I'm going to ask you how much trust you have in various people's institutions. So here, trust is not defined. Right? We just simply say, do you trust these people? We allow people to define trust themselves. So we gave them these varieties of institutions. And the police were in there as a kind of potential comparator, but you know, it can be showed that indeed politicians are trusted as somebody else. So on the, le the left-hand side, you can see the figures are pretty similar. It doesn't matter if we talk about governments or parliament or politicians, all pretty similar, and they all come up pretty badly as compared with the police. Now, um, so that, you know, there seems to be a problem there, okay? The problem's got worse, apparently, um, uh, so could the coalition do anything about it? Now, we had a couple of criteria to work out whether or not um, a possible reform had, had any hope of success in improving trust. The first thing is that we said, well, it ought to be generally popular. Right? The public ought to think this is a good, a good idea. But then secondly, were the, were, was a particular reform something that appealed rather more to people with low levels of trust or than high trust? <coughs> is this something, in other words, that appears to reach parts of the political fabric of the, of, of, of the public that other parts of politics don't reach. Okay, um, <coughs> here are some indicators of the levels of popularity of the various uh, uh, proposals that the government had, and there are a few comparisons here as well. Um, we've kind of done a few tricks in order to get this all on one slide. Um, so for example, where it says candidate selection, all voters, but th th these two figures, so th these are about open primaries. And in order to come up with that figure on the slide, basically what we're saying is that six percent more people thought that allowing all voters to have a role in a candidate selection uh, backed that idea, as opposed to keeping the status quo. And four percent more people thought having a primary that was confined to the supporters of that party. Um, so I guess you've got it. Public basically was split about third and third and third on the idea of primaries between the three options that were presented. Them. Um, in some cases, we had more than one measure. So in the case of police and crime commissioners, we both gave respondents the negative argument, too much political interference. They said they were totally inclined to agree with that. We also gave them the positive argument, that encouraged the police to focus more on crime. They thought, yeah, that's, that, that, that would be true. So they could, they could think about both, say, agree with both things at the same time. And the same is true about directly elected mayors. They could indeed, to some degree, be to endorse the criticism, they too much power. For one person, but equally, they also felt that yes, indeed, somebody would speak up for the error. Um, the measure on fixed term parliaments, that's very specifically about five year fixed term parliaments. Fixed term parliaments are popular. What isn't popular is the idea of creating for yourself a fixed term of five years, as opposed to four years or three years. So uh, the idea of politicians kind of giving themselves a, lot, a nice and long guaranteed. Uh, job is not so popular as opposed to requiring them to go back to the public on a relatively frequent occasion. So that's why that comes out as negative. Um, electoral reform, by 2011, the, uh, the, the, the idea of proportional representation, which is that, well, that's a measure of support for that, knows directly the uh, AV campaign and uh, reached its high. So anyway, as you can so that therefore the Westminster reforms at the bottom of there, fixed end parliaments and electoral reform, actually not particularly popular by 2011. The candidate centre reforms, a bit mixture, right? The ones that end up being much more popular are the idea of voters, voters recall, particularly if MPs have broken the rules. The idea of local referendums, if you have a council tax, is supposed to be too high. Uh, the referendum on Europe is not the referendum we're now talking about Europe, it's the referendums that have been legislated for. If, there is deep, if we were going to be more part of Brussels. Having a referendum on electoral reform, yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. 
and local initiatives. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you'll notice it's the more radical, quote unquote, direct democracy things that were more popular. But then, however, to whom do these appeal? Let me go through this very quickly. Uh, uh, essentially, it's just telling you how, what we did. We, we took the, those, those measures of trust about how much do you trust politicians, government, and parliament, and used it to construct a scale. And we're then taking the people at the two endpoints of the scale just to simply show you how uh, compare the case of those people on low trust and high trust. Um, for what it's worth, um, I mean, in, uh, the idea of the so called representative forms, which we've already said to you, are not actually particularly very popular, so they've already been, been thrown out the window. They're, they're a bit more popular amongst those people with low trust, but not radically so. You can see here how three yearly elections are much more popular with people with low trust. Five year elections weren't particularly popular. Um, Mostly elected House of Lords, yes, please, uh, that is relatively popular among, uh, amongst those who don't trust, but not radical differences here. Um, as far as the candidate centered reforms, now, I mean, here, I don't know if Jerry can answer this one for me because this, was, this is something he's deeply interested. Of all of these reforms, the one reform that actually is less popular amongst those people with low trust than it is amongst those with high trust was the idea of direct elected mayors. It doesn't matter if we use the positive or the negative word of item. But it comes up as an oddball, which I have to admit I've not really got to the bottom of. But for our purposes, therefore, it gets discarded as a relevant reform because A, it doesn't, it's not necessarily obviously particularly popular, and B, it isn't particularly popular amongst the group amongst whom it needs to be particularly popular. On the other hand, we have police and crime commissioners, yes, but um, not dramatically so, and the open primaries were relatively popular. <coughs> what about the direct democracy ones? Because these are the ones that are apparently the most popular. No, I mean, there aren't dramatic differences here, but there are some pretty, some pretty good ones, particularly MPs recall, particularly going for a form of MPs recall, which isn't just about if Westminster thinks you've been a naughty boy, we will, let you, we will throw you to the walls. This is the idea of the voters saying, hang on, you're not doing a terribly good job, we want to throw you out. Uh, so much more radical than has currently been thought about. Local initiatives again, people with low trust, yes, please, uh, that's pretty keen on. And even the idea of the, uh, the European referendum as it's currently constituted is also very popular. So again, direct democracy seems to, seems to um, uh, tick the boxes more successfully than anything else. Then, um, for those of you who are of this disposition, um, this is basically, we're doing, we're doing a multi-vote analysis. These are the local coefficients for the various possibilities. And, and we're just showing you the various controls in there. These are the uh, co coefficients for uh, trust. Um, and basically, uh, the thing to take away is that the, the purple ones up there, which are the ones for um, the direct democracy items, still emerge as being a significant difference once you throw a few other things up the dependent ground. OK, so um, essentially two conclusions. Um, does it matter that the coalition has largely failed? Um, not as perhaps as much as some people would, who are in favour of some of these forms would like to think. Uh, that it's not entirely clear that, that some of these reforms that have, got, that have gone forward by the wayside were necessarily going to be particularly good at helping to restore trust. The things that, however, do seem to perhaps to have some potential are those reforms uh, that involve direct democracy i.e. those reforms that to some degree begin to bypass the political class and begin to put perhaps control of the political agenda in the hands of the public as opposed to in the hands of politicians. In other words, the sorry conclusion that the political class may be is that we might be able to restore trust in them if we can stop them actually having been as powerful as they are at the moment. But, um, that may not be the conclusion they would like to hear. John, <coughs> 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 